morning, girls of gorgeousness. Good morning, girls of the gorge. Hello. Hello. Yeah, I know. I know. Exciting. Instant escape, hey girlies, don't even pretend to stay in anymore. Nope, pop straight over the fence, huh? Yes. Good morning, chaps. Good morning. It has been chucking it down all morning so far, and we've just got a break in the weather. We actually had a little bit of blue sky and a bit of sunshine a minute ago. It seems to have seems to have clouded over, but I can still see blue sky, so I'm optimistic it's coming back. <laughs> but yeah, it's been terrible weather like the last two days. It has just bucketed it down. So the ground is completely sodden, but I'm determined to get the first lot of potatoes in this morning. So you know we had all the mealy bug problems last week, but the lot that I'm gonna put out today is the Caledonian Pearl, and they weren't really that badly affected because we got them quite a lot later than the potatoes that have been chitting in the greenhouse for a long time. So firstly, they were less badly affected, and I just took a paintbrush and uh, brushed them all off. I had sprayed them with soap, but it seems to have killed the little tiny ones, but not the big ones. Um, so I've just been kind of manually brushing with a soft, like, you know, like a blusher brush uh, and they seem to have all gone. But with those first earlies and the second earlies that I'm going to put into the bed, I don't feel like it's going to be a major problem because the mealybugs themselves are more of a houseplant pest. They like it warm and humid and it is not warm or humid out here at the moment. So I think when I plant them out, they're going to just die off anyway. So I don't think they're going to be that much of a problem. The ones that I do think it's going to be a problem for are the main crop and the second earlies that I'm not planting out into the bed because I'm not ready to plant them out yet. So they're going to be in the conservatory just that bit longer. So I'm going to really, I'm going to brush them all off as well tonight and be quite diligent at keeping brushing them just to stop um, the infestation getting any worse. I mean, the mealybugs are not the end of the world. It's not like they're going to infect them with anything, but they're sap suckers, you know, so they're all around the nice tender new shoots and a bit like aphids in that sense. So it's not great but um, it's also not the end of the world. And don't worry, I'm not gonna give you any more close-ups of mealybugs. <laughs> but I said that we had um, the Caledonian Pearl ready to go. They've been chitting at home. Um, and I also said last week that we ordered ourselves some Red Duke of York. Well, what we've actually ordered ourselves are Duke of York, not Red Duke. So, so we have a bag of Duke of York, which are the white ones, not the red ones. I've never grown the white Duke of York. Um, I'm, a, I'm a little bit sad because red Duke of York is my absolute favorite, but although I could go out and order more red Dukes, by now we've got about double the amount of potatoes that we intended <laughs> to actually be growing this year. So I'm not gonna do that. We are just gonna go with the white Duke of Yorks. And then we've got a little bit of faff to do in the bed that we want to put them in because we've got some dahlias in the end there, but neither of the dahlias we want to keep in that spot. One of them is the really dwarf one. And I was only intending to have really nice tall dahlias in the beds because I was gonna use them more like a crop. Um, you know, we're gonna use them for cut flower. Well, the dwarf one's absolutely useless for that. So that is going to be turfed out of the bed and put into the flower bed next to the pond. And then there is a tall one in there, but it wasn't great last year. So we're gonna put it in a pot and see if we can kind of feed it up and get it looking a bit better before we decide where it's got to go. So my first task is to clear out that bed really, just get it ready. It's also got a lot of the excess soil on it from the polytunnel. So I'm gonna uh, chuck that into maybe some bags or put it onto the bed next to it or something, but anyway, it's got to go. So yeah, right. 
let's get some potatoes in. Okay, potato spacing. We have got 12 of the Caledonian Pearl and 12 of the White Duke of York. I'm going to put them all in the same bed. Uh, these are earlies. If this was main crop, I wouldn't try and fit this many in. The main crop are in the ground for so much longer and the potatoes are so much bigger. Their root systems are so much bigger. Whereas earlies, they're much daintier little plants and you can get away with jamming them in that little bit closer. They're only going to be in the ground for three months, maybe four at an absolute push. These are going to be grown in sort of three rows along the length of the bed and I'll earth them up that way rather than across the bed the short way. This many potatoes in this size bed, which is our standard size bed, which is 1 metre 20 by 2 metres 40, works out at about 45 centimetres between the rows and 30 centimetres between each potato plant in that row. This bed actually missed out on having its mulch over the autumn, so I'm going to throw a bit of bloodfish and bone into each of the planting holes for the potatoes. I'm just going to sprinkle it in the bottom and then mix it around so the potatoes aren't sitting directly on a bed of bloodfish and bone. That would just burn them, but just giving it a bit of a mix around and um, making that available for them. So hopefully, come the end of June, we're going to be hauling vast quantities of beautiful little potatoes out of this bed. <laughs> I'm quite curious actually to see how different the white Duke of York is to the red Duke of York. I mean, colour aside, obviously, <laughs> they're a bit different in that sense, but flavour wise and what they're good for, because the red Duke of York, what they're so excellent for is when you just chop them up, boil them just to the point where they're soft and they're just so buttery and crumbly and oh, absolute bliss. They make great uh, roast potatoes, they make great mashed potato, they make great, well, they just great potatoes. So fingers crossed, the White Duke of York 
is of a similar vein. I'm going to earth these up long ways across the bed, like I said, which was where the biggest gap between the potatoes was. Uh, not huge, just enough that I can define where the rows are. And then I'll wait for the potatoes to grow up through the top. And once they've got a bit of foliage, I'll just keep covering that foliage up. So we end up with three neat rows of mounded potatoes. Ah, oh, potatoes are in. I tell you what, it is a magnificent afternoon up here. Seriously, after all that rain this morning, and this wasn't predicted. Let me just show you, let me tip you up so you can see the sky. It's gorgeous. I mean, the sun's coming in and out. It's not so constant, but oh, I feel so much like spring right now. Oh, it's just beautiful. I mean, it is spring. Technically, it is spring, but we've had some pretty unspring like weather, I'd say. It's been really cold again and, and just constant rain. But this, and as I've just been walking around, like glorying in the beautiful day, I've noticed loads of things have just burst into life and there's loads of new stuff. So I'm just going to do a bit of a like, oh, look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this thing. Let's do that. First thing to show you is the apricot tree. So obviously, you heard me talking about the apricot tree. It's the same problem every year. Uh, this year though, I was really thinking we might have just, when I've been looking at like all the blossoms, it's all gone over and I can't see anything and I can't see anything. Well, I've just spotted an apricot. Feast your eyes on this, chaps. Where is it? Oh, I've lost it. Oh no, where is it? I just, I just leant over this way. Oh yeah, here, look at that. So a lot of the flowers are looking more like this. So they've obviously not been fertilized. You can see that there's nothing going on in there. But there is this one, apricot here. And I have seen another. Can you see if I just, I don't want to knock the other apricot off, but just there, there's another one. So just from this little patch down here, I think further up where the blossom was slower to come out, we may have some good ones. So that is something to look forward to seriously. So excited just seeing that first like little nub sticking out of the end of the um, like dead bud is just so good. Right, more exciting things. Proto figs are forming. So that bodes well on the fig front for this year. And the pear is in absolute full blossom. It is so beautiful. What a gorgeous little tree this is. This is the conference pear. Last year we got two very small pairs of it. Uh, the amount of blossom we've got on this year bodes well for a bit more. Oh, and the daffodils underneath are just looking so lovely. But look at this mysterious stripiness on these. They're supposed to look like this, just plain yellow with a little pale blush in the center. It's not um, daffodil stripe virus though, because that normally affects the leaves and these leaves are totally fine. So some other virus making them stripy. The red currants are just coming into flower. This is the one that's outside of the fruit cage that we leave to the birds. But inside the fruit cage, look at this, the beauty that is gooseberry flowers. I mean, they're so cute. They're teeny tiny little things. But I'm really pleased to say that a lot of these bushes that didn't flower or fruit at all last year are flowering brilliantly. The grape is just starting to put on a bit of something. So that is exciting. Hopefully I'm going to get that really nicely trained around the top of this cage this year. Raspberries are all bursting into life. I really need to get a mulch down on these chaps. Sure, I might do that tomorrow. The Loganberry, look at this. It's absolutely covered in flowers. We had like two little bunches of flowers last year and got some fruit off it first time. This year it's absolutely smothered. And also wildly exciting, there's an asparagus emergence happening. Come on girls, clear off, not the asparagus loves. Go on, off you go. Look down here, Ooh, big fatties coming out. Look, white ones, this is where the girls have just uh, kicked them up. That's like the French like them where they've been blanched. Oh, 
just cover those back up. Oi! Bugger off, Flo. I don't like you in the asparagus beds. Go on, boof, boof, boof. Go on, off you go. Any other bed, not this one. Any other bed. So yeah, this is the new asparagus bed um, where we planted the 10 crowns, what, three years ago? And uh, every single one of them was taken. So I'm absolutely chuffed with this. There is also action happening in the old asparagus bed, but I mean, these plants are really starting to wane a bit now. Um, I've given them a really, really good mulch this year though. So we we'll see if we can G them up a bit. Hang on, I just, just saw some over here. Where are they? Oh yeah, there. Little teeny tinies just starting to emerge at the back there. Won't be long till it's asparagus with everything. Oh, the best time of year. This is the red Russian kale that we actually didn't really get round to eating very much. I sowed it very late last year, I think. And um, I'm trying to remember, but I think this was the one that I did really super late. Didn't get the seeds until much later. Um, we will be doing it again this year because it was delicious what we did eat, um, but it's obviously gone completely to seed. Uh, and we're just gonna take this all home and strip it off and eat basically everything apart from the stalks. Flower heads are delicious. I mean, the stalks up until about this point are still quite tender, so we'll eat all that, but down here, a bit woody. Right, I think we're probably ready to put the girlies away and head home, to be honest, even though it's a beautiful, beautiful afternoon. As you can see, like the wind is picking up and that wind is chill. Chill, I think it's gonna be a cold night tonight. Right in there, but cut. Come on, Florence. In. You know where you're supposed to go. Few more things I've spotted just as we're heading out the door. This was the really, really successful, but not very many chimidi wrapper flowering away <laughs> quite happily. That's completely gone. The cranby, the um, sea kale is uh, coming good. That's the one that kind of rooted itself through the bottom of the pot. And this, look, in a couple of days time, this is all gonna be out. This is the quince tree. It's not actually on our plot, it's on our neighbor's plot, but it is the most beautiful blossom. I can't wait till that comes out. And look, the little auricula. So sweet. These have just been plonked in a pot outside the greenhouse. Nothing is ever done to them and they are so pretty. Talking of like survivors, this one tulip here, uh, this used to be in the fruit cage. I mean, it's been down here flowering for about 10 years. It's an absolute gem. Look at that gorgeousness. The tulips that we put in the uh, woodland bed uh, got completely got by both slugs and chickens, although that looks like a bit of a weird fried egg, that one. It's kind of splayed open, but this, look, it's just completely obliterated. Oh, Mum! Look! Oh, that's our wild garlic. That is our wild garlic. Oh, that's, that's exciting. Good. I thought we'd planted that and it hadn't taken. Fab. Anyway, the parsley is also going to seed, you know, the one that we transplanted out of the uh, polytunnel. So just nipping off the heads of that, we can keep it going a little bit longer. Good morning. Yep, we are here busy practicing attack moves, aren't we, Hayley? Yeah, I know. Boof, 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 boof. So mighty. Look at that. Anyway, yesterday was my birthday. Um, I had an incredibly sedate one, went out for lunch, went to the cinema, sat by the river, enjoyed a pint, it was super chill. <laughs> not not the phone charger, Haley. there we go. Yeah. Boof, boof. Boof, boof, boof. Attack, attack, attack. Yeah, um, so yeah, yesterday was my birthday, but today we have our first vet's appointment. Mm, I know, a whole new world for, ooh. <laughs> A whole new world for you, Haley. Yep. 
Um, sorry, I'm actually trying to change the bed sheets. That's what this big white thing is that <laughs> she's playing on. But everything is now 10 times more difficult. Now we've got a kitten in the house. Yeah, attack, 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 attack. Anyway, right, I've got to get you in the box, madam. So that's time. Well, we made it, little sausage. Oh, she looks so tiny in this little box. <laughs> Love, I remember Annie, this is Annie's old box, obviously, and he practically filled it. <laughs> there was none of this rolling around in there for him. No. I know, but we're not going to film in the vets, are we? No, we're not. No. So, uh, wish us luck and uh, we will see you on the other side. Oh, very, very concerned there, just yawning, roll around, have a bit of a wash. As you can see, she's terribly panicked. <laughs> we're home, we're home. That was very successful. Inoculations didn't start this week um, because the vet thinks she's just slightly younger than we thought she was. So we're gonna hold off for a week just to be safe. So we're gonna start all of that jazz next week. Hey, madam. Yes, we are. We got this tunnel, just like a cat toy tunnel. She absolutely loves it. <laughs> She's just like charging through it all the time. Anyway, excellent. It's so rare that you buy a cat a cat toy and they actually like it. <laughs> anyway, yes. So this little birthday present of joy and wonder um, is still being a joy and a wonder. Hey, Ooh. go on, get him, get him, get him. Bite his toes. Bite his toes. My apologies for the slight change in lighting. It is now night time. <laughs> so I set these trays out earlier in the day, like, right, I'm gonna do my tomatoes. Uh, but it has taken me so long to narrow down what I'm actually gonna sow that the sun has gone down. The only advantage of that though, is that now we have a glass of wine. Mm. So like I say, it's taken me a good couple of hours to go through what I'm actually going to sow. I had so many tomato varieties to choose from. 50 something, I'm not kidding. No, it was more than 50. It was a lot more than 50. Anyway, <laughs> 
ignoring that, I'd already done one culling of ones that I've tried before and then didn't want to grow again. So that first lot was culled and then I was left with like 50. Now I don't have room to grow 50 tomato plants. If I could grow them outside, uh, I would have room for more. But we have blight every single year. It's a certainty. Whether it comes really early in the year or it comes late, uh, we're gonna get it. So <laughs> growing hundreds of exciting tomato varieties and sticking them outside to die and not even get a tomato off them isn't really an option. So I'm limited to how many I can grow. I'm gonna be growing them in four places this year. The main epicenter of the tomato growing experience is gonna be the polytunnel as per usual, but I've only got space for 17 plants in there. And that is where I'm most likely to get the success. It's got the right temperature, it's warm, it's everything about it is just right for growing tomatoes. So that's the hub. There is gonna be like a central 17 varieties that go in there. The, the other places I've got to grow is I've got two spillover locations that are not as blight protected as the polytunnel, but are pretty good. So I've got the back garden here, which um, although it is outdoors and it's out in the open, because uh, it's not so surrounded by other people growing solanums or growing vegetables of any sort, we have been very lucky, and I touch wood, uh, we have been very lucky with not getting blight here. Blight is windborne, and so if you're growing in an allotment site, for example, where every other allotment has tomatoes, it will spread across that really, really quickly. Here we're very protected, We've got sort of brick walls all around, it's a sheltered garden, so it's not a huge amount of kind of wind blowing in, and nobody else is growing vegetables slash tomatoes or potatoes in the area. So that's quite a decent spillover. However, the plants are gonna be growing outside, so I've gotta focus on plants which are gonna be more successful growing in cooler conditions in the garden. Depending on the summer, I could get away with growing the really exciting kind of hothouse varieties, but we don't know what the summer's gonna be like, so I'm kind of finding ways to kind of divide these up. And then the fourth area that I'm gonna be growing is actually outdoors at the allotment, and I'm focusing on blight-resistant varieties for out there. I asked you last week if you had any suggestions for blight resistant varieties and I did get a load. Haven't had a chance to reply to them yet. I'm going to sit down and do that this evening hopefully. But that is my four spaces. Polytunnel, epicenter, greenhouse and back garden here, spillover, a dedicated bed at the allotment for the blight resistant varieties. Now it has taken me a long time to narrow it down And we're at 28 varieties. Let me grab my grab my list. <laughs> so we have 28 varieties overall that I couldn't say no to. 20 of those are ones that I would ideally like to be growing in the polytunnel. Like I said, I've only got space for 17. So we're just going to go with them and 17 will go into the polytunnel and three will probably go into the greenhouse. So these are the nominees. Sounds like the Oscars. I normally do four cherry tomatoes. I normally do Sun Gold, Brad's Atomic Grape, Garnet, and Green Doctor. That gives me a really good spread. Sun Gold is the super, super sweet yellow one. Green Doctor is a slightly tarter, but still absolutely delicious green one. Brad's Atomic Grape is sort of a long, dark, beautiful thing. And then there's Garnet, which is like a dark red cherry tomato. So that gives me a really good spectrum, but I've gone slightly bigger this year and I've added two to that and swapped out the Brad's Atomic Grape for Brad's Atomic Fusion, which by all accounts is an improved version of Brad's Atomic Grape. Now the, the fruit on Brad's Atomic Grape is absolutely exceptional. I love them. They're quite tart uh, and they're quite difficult to tell when they're ripe. I think a lot of people make the mistake of picking them too early. You've got, they take a long time to, get, to really kind of sweeten up. But if you were listening to Potty Mouth last week, uh, we discussed a bit of Brad's Atomic Grape and how actually the plants themselves are just a bit weak and wispy. And apparently Brad's Atomic Fusion, similar on the fruit front, but produces more on a much stronger plant. So I've swapped that one out. And I've also added two extras. I'm just counting that. There's three extras. There's seven listed in my cherry tomato section. Oh well, we're having seven cherry tomatoes this year. The first edition is Bliss, which is a uh, miniature plum shape. So like the Brad's Atomic Grape with the 
elongated with a pointy bottom, but it is bright yellow. Another one that's of a similar shape is called Prairie Fire, which was on my list for last year, but I just ran out of space so I couldn't grow it, so I'm definitely doing that. That is also elongated yellow, but with red streaks down it, so like a bit of a kind of Tigarella style, but in a, in a grape shape. And the final one is Black Strawberry, which is one that JB has given me. It was his favourite from last year, so obviously I've got to grow that one. So that is seven cherries. I've really made the decisions um, on what they're, what's sort of said about the flavour. I mean, the, the thing is, you can get so caught up in what the tomatoes look like because they are incredible. The variety of tomatoes you can get out there is just really exciting. Um, but I know that a very beautiful tomato doesn't necessarily taste that fantastic. So I have gone directly for taste. The rest of the tomatoes in that category are, it really does sound like the Oscars, Japanese Black Trefelli. As you know, I grow this one every year. This was not up for debate. It's a really heavy, I call it a coin purse shape. You know, like a medieval coin purse. It's narrow at the top gets really fat bummed at the bottom. It's quite a dark colour and the flavour out of this world. Absolutely love it. Great looking plant, produces lots. There wasn't any way that wasn't going to be part of the game this year. I'm having another go with Black Beauty, which is the really, really dark mid-sized fruit. They look incredible on the plant. They are proper black. It's not like when they say like a black, uh, Japanese Black Trefelli where it's they, they're calling it black because it's dark or like a black Russian or a black crim. Um, where it's just a dark red. These are like ink black and they're stunning. So yeah, they're, they're also on the list. A new one for me this year, uh, which was incredibly tempting because of the name, which is Rebel Starfighter Prime. I mean, how could you not grow that? Seriously. However, I tried to put my sensible cap on, looked up, I was like, well, does it say anything about the flavour? And the flavour reviews for it were outstanding. So that made the cut, which I'm incredibly pleased about secretly. <laughs> Two more with black names. I've got Black Moon and Black Crim. So I always used to grow Black Russian, um, but Black Crim is basically the same tomato. Um, I've just got seeds for Black Crim this year. A fantastic tomato, really, really reliable, bit gnarly on the outside, but cooks brilliantly. Black Moon, I've never grown before, but it looks beautiful. Mid-sized tomato, like dark purple top, red underneath, really good reviews on flavour. I've also obviously got Alice's Dream in there, which was my out and out favourite last year, like a surprise favourite. Um, when mum and I did the taste test in the garden, like end of the summer, it was properly like a silent moment when we were eating it. It was absolutely delicious. Beautiful tomato, yellow on the bottom, purple on the top, and quite like a flat shape, not like a big fat round tomato. It was like, you know, like it had been squashed slightly and it was absolutely delicious. So that's definitely on the list. And one joining it is one called Sartre Relais, which is a tomato I've heard about for years. But when I was reading up about Alice's Dream, apparently that was bred from Sartre Relais. And so I'm really interested to kind of compare the two. So both of them are on the list this year. Pork Chop, obviously, another one that came out brilliantly in the taste test last year. Big, fat, bright yellow beef tomato. And I've had a bit of not that great success with yellow beef tomatoes or like pale beef tomatoes in the past. But this one really bucked the trend. I mean, pork chop, it was just a, oof, it was just a beautiful tomato. And then we've got five at the bottom of this list, which were ones that I undenied about, but I couldn't say no to having read the reviews. And these are ones that I've never grown before. So that's Mortgage Lifter. Goat Bag, Beauty King, Sergeant Pepper, and Dark Galaxy, all of which come with rave flavour reviews. Dark Galaxy is very, very beautiful with like a speckled outside, so it kind of looks like a galaxy. Sergeant Pepper is heart shaped. From the person that I read the review of, said it was the best tasting tomato they'd ever grown. Excited about that. Beauty King likewise has absolute rave reviews about its flavour. Goat Bag, very interestingly, um, people were saying it's got like quite a smoky flavour, almost like a smoked sausage flavour behind it. I've never had a tomato that tastes like a smoked sausage, so I'm quite looking forward to that. And Mortgage Lifter is a whopper, an absolutely huge, big red beef tomato with outstanding reviews flavour-wise too. So that is my main selection that are going to go into the polytunnel or the greenhouse. I'm gonna sow two 
or four of each of those, depending on how desperate I am to have them. Things like Japanese black trefelli, the Alice's Dream, black crim pork chop, the ones that I know that I'd be really, really sad if I didn't have in my collection, I'll be sewing four of just to make sure that I get something. All the rest will have two, and I'm gonna be pretty ruthless about it. If neither of them come up, I'm unlikely to re-sew. However, you know what tomatoes are like. They, <laughs> They do not struggle to germinate. And so if I do end up with two of everything and four of the ones that I've sewn extra of, you know, somebody will always take them and I can always plonk them in the back garden, no harm done uh, if they don't grow. So the ones that I'm dedicating to growing at home though, not the overflow, the ones which I know will grow really well outside, I've got four of them. So these are ones that aren't gonna be either in the greenhouse or the polytunnel and it's Beauty King which is quite a gnarly tomato. It splits a lot at the top from what I can see, but apparently it'll grow really, really well in outdoor climate. So I'm quite happy to have that one out here. It's a big tomato though. Um, Jet Setter and Oregon Spring are two that I grew last year that I was very kindly given. Actually, so many of these I've been given, but these were given to me when my tomatoes failed at the beginning of last year because they're very short season tomatoes. So they do really well outside. Um, they don't need the, the heat of the greenhouse to really get going. And they were fantastic, really successful. Jet Setter actually uh, was a great tomato and it did, I wouldn't say it was blight proof, but it survived the blight a lot better than the rest of the chaps up there. So I might sow extra of them and put some of them in the blight resistant category. But talking of blight resistant categories, I'm growing four. I'm growing Nagina, Burlesque, Crocchini and Furline. They're all red, they're all supposedly blight resistant and all four of them have been given to me by people. I know there's one that's a really famous blight resistant one. Now what's it called? I was just going to look it up but I've remembered it's Crimson Crush I think and I, I was like oh I must get some Crimson Crush, must get some Crimson Crush but I have heard some really just nothingness reviews about how it tasted. Like, yes, totally blight resistant, but what's the point if it tastes like a red sack of water? No, so I'm not growing that one. You know, there are so many in the box that just looked fantastic, but didn't make the cut. And I've just got to live with that. I can't grow, I'm, I don't have a polytunnel, you know, like, like these absolutely massive ones that like you could basically move into. I don't have that. I've just got what I've got. So I just have to be patient and some of the ones that I've decided not to grow I actually I made like the executive decision that it won't be this year and they've been put automatically on next year because they're fresh seed I know they're going to be fine for next year and I'll just work my way through what we've got here whittle down the best from this current year like I did last year and then each year we just get a better and better list so what I really don't want are messages, comments underneath saying, oh my God, you've missed off this one. You can't, you can't live without this one because that is not helpful, chaps. <laughs> Give it to me for next year, not this year, because this has taken me hours to get to this point. The tomatoes are in. Mm. Just in time for me to need another glass of wine pretty handy isn't it anyway it's quite late now <laughs> so I'm gonna go and cuddle Haley and um, call it a night but tomorrow the weather is looking pretty good and I talking of Haley basically my entire month <laughs> the last two weeks have been completely disrailed by a tiny black and white thing um, and I've still got a huge list of things that need to be sewn in fact, let me just get the list for you. Tomorrow morning, I'm gonna seal myself away in the greenhouse and I'm going to sow Petrovsky turnips, Komatsuma, which is a type of like Asian green, a bit like a pak choy, but a bit skinnier. Agretti, which is something I've never grown before, but it's like a, it's like if a chive had a baby with samphire uh, and it's quite bitter tasting, but it's absolutely delicious. And uh, I've been wanting to grow it for ages and I got hold of some seeds, so a Gretti. I've got to sow wild rocket and wide leaf rocket, 
Cavalier Nero needs to go in. The Mizuna needs to go in. Three types of beetroot I want to sow. I haven't got any beetroot in yet, which is going to be Bolt Hardy, Burpees Golden and Kyogia. I also have that really sexy uh, kohlrabi that I picked up from She Grows Veg at um, the media event fair day thing, whatever that was. You know, the one with the, like, the green and the purple. Oh, it was beautiful. Got to get that in. Now I've got two cabbages I'm going to get in. One is Kalibos, which is a pointy red one. Uh, also Primo cabbage, which is just a round green one. But it's like a compact space one. So I'm hoping it's not going to be one of those massive cabbages, which takes up like three quarters of a bed. I have Rudolph purple sprouting broccoli to get in, Kalets, Crispus Brussels sprouts, and the chickpeas. Yeah, it's gonna be a busy morning. It's gonna be a busy morning. But the sun's supposed to be out, so it'll be beautiful. And it's that time of the week again, chaps. The end. It has been quite a week. So today is the very last day of March. Um, tomorrow it is April. I'm not going to tell you how shocked I am that it's April tomorrow. Um, <laughs> it happens to me every month that we have a change. I'm like, oh. Anyway, it's April tomorrow. Miraculously managed to get all that sewing done this morning, just sat there in the sunshine, in the greenhouse. It was bliss. It is now chucking it down. 
so definitely chose the right time of the day to be up at the allotment. But uh, yeah, that God, that is so satisfying. All those trays just like really neatly laid out. But yeah, all of the stuff that I was running behind with in March, I got it all in at the last minute. Now we're on to the April sewings, which, whew, that is the big stuff. That's like the serious stuff. So the, the, the three stages, obviously, you've got the really early stuff, which is the peppers and the aubergines. In my head, you've got that lot right early January. Then you have lots of bits and pieces, kind of February. Then you've got tomatoes in March. Come April, you've got courgettes and beans. Whew. Yeah, big times. But yeah, we have had done so much this week, not just like allotmenting stuff, but like, but like Hallie had her first vet's appointment, obviously that went very smoothly. Interestingly, that the, that the vet thought that she was slightly younger um, than we thought she was, because when we picked her up, obviously she was with the rest of the kittens, but all the kittens were of a similar size. So it wasn't like she was particularly small um, for her brothers and sisters. So she was saying just to be safe, we'll just leave it another week. So we'll be back at the vet next week. We had the whole Easter thing going on. Uh, so Good Friday was my birthday. Then on Saturday, we had the boat race, which is a big thing around here, which is Oxford and Cambridge. They have their rowing race up the Thames. Uh, although we're not anywhere near Oxford or Cambridge, they all have their rowing clubs on the Thames just down here, like near Barnes or like Putney Barnes between the two. And so that's really close to here. So yeah, boat race day is a big day and they lucked out on the weather hugely because it had been raining, 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 raining. And then the boat race came and it was beautiful sunshine. So that was really nice for them. And all that Eastering stuff means it's also bank holiday tomorrow. So Sunday today, tomorrow is a bank holiday. And on top of that, we've just gone through daylight savings. So it is now an hour, like the day, is, the day isn't an hour longer, but you know what I mean? Like the evening is an hour lighter, which is just so nice. It was like 7.30 yesterday and it was still light outside. Ah, oh, I love it. Absolutely love it. Yes, yeah, so it's been a bit of a whammer of uh, a week this one. Oh, and obviously like getting the tomatoes in and the potatoes. Whew. Yeah, it's been a big one. Anyway, you may possibly have noticed um, a couple of Easter eggs hanging around while we're talking about Easter, hanging around in, in the video. Uh, it's mainly a game for my Patreons, I must say. There's sort of uh, prizes to be had for my Patreons on that one. There is an anagram in there. But anybody who gets the anagram, put it in the comments underneath. Don't look at everybody else's comments, because obviously as they start filtering through, play the game properly. And if you put your answer down underneath, I will uh, read your name out next week. I know it's not much of a prize, but you know. <laughs> so yes, happy Easter, everybody. Uh, I am another year older. We've got potatoes in. The cat's younger. <laughs> oh man. She's really getting good on the hunting skills though. Like I love that little, you know, like that little sideways jump they do. God, I love it. So talking of Hallie, like she was gonna be up here in this video. Like mostly she's just like stuck on my shoulder, to be honest, but um, we've made the adjustment so that she now sleeps downstairs and I used one of the heated propagator trays, just put a towel in it and she is obsessed, absolutely obsessed. And funnily enough, like I was given those two propagator trays, they're just like the simple plug-in ones, you know, there's no temperature dial on them. They're not particularly hot, but they're just like enough to be warm. And I was given the two trays by a friend of mine who's got two cats who it was impossible for her to grow or start any seedlings in there, even if she put a cover on the top, because her two cats just came along, booted the cover off, booted all the seedlings out and lay in it themselves. So yeah, heated propagator doubles as cat bed and Hallie is as happy as a cat can be. In fact, I'll, I'll go down and film her just at the end of this. I'll use, she's just like that in the heated propagator. Yeah, so cheers, chaps. I will see you next week for April. Bye.